myself and maybe for others who are interested. Obviously, I am not a professional ASMR mistress or whatever the people who do this are called, uh, so forgive me uh, in advance. But um, yeah, let's get started. Today we have the Communist Manifesto. However, 
confusing each other, bourgeoisie and proletariat. From the serfs of the Middle Ages sprang the chartered burghers of the earliest towns. From the from these burgesses, <laughs> my first language is not English, as you can gather. The first element of the bourgeoisie were developed. The discovery of America, the rounding of the Cape, opened up fresh ground for the rising bourgeoisie. The East Indian and Chinese markets, the colonization of America, trade with the colonies, the increase in the means of exchange and in commodities generally, gave to commerce, to navigation, to industry, an impulse never before known, and thereby to the revolutionary element in the tottering feudal society, a rapid development. The feudal system of industry, under which industrial production was monopolized by close guilds, now no longer sufficed for the growing wants of the new markets. The manufacturing system took its place. The guild masters were pushed on one side by the manufacturing middle class. Division of labor between different corporate guilds vanished in the face of division of labor in each single workshop. Meantime, the markets kept ever, ever growing, the demand ever rising. Even manufacture no longer sufficed. Thereupon, steam and machinery revolutionized industrial production. The place of manufacture was taken by the giant modern industry. The place of the industrial middle class by industrial millionaires, the leaders of all industrial armies, the modern bourgeois. Modern industry has established the world market for which the discovery of America paved the way. This market has given an immense development to commerce, to navigation, to communication by land. This development has, in its turn, reacted on the extension of industry, and in proportion as industry, commerce, navigation, railways extended, in the same proportion the bourgeoisie developed, increased its capital, and pushed into the background every class handed down from the Middle Ages. We see, therefore, how the modern bourgeoisie is itself the product of a long course of development of a series of revolution in the modes of production and of exchange. Each step in the development of the bourgeoisie was accompanied by a corresponding political advance of that class, an oppressed class under the sway of the feudal nobility, an armed and self-governing association in the medieval commune, here in dependent urban republic as in Italy and Germany, their taxable third estate of the monarchy, as in France, afterwards in the period of manufacture proper, serving either the semi-feudal or the absolute monarchy as a contrapoise against the nobility, and, in fact, cornerstone of the great monarchies in general, the bourgeoisie has at last, since the establishment of modern industry and of the world market, conquered for itself in the modern representative state, exclusive political sway. The executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie historically has played a most revolutionary part. The bourgeoisie, wherever it has to cut the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has pitilessly turned, torn, asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors, and has left remaining no other nexus between man and man that naked self-interest than Calio's cash payment. It has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of philistine sentimentalism, in the icy water of egotistical calculation. It has resolved personal worth into exchange value, and in place of the numberless indefensible chartered freedom, has set up that single unconscious, unconscious, unconscionable freedom, free trade. In one word, for exploitation, failed by religious and political illusion, it has substituted naked, shameless, direct, brutal exploitation. The bourgeois has stripped off its halo every occupation hitherto honored and locked up to and looked up to with reverent awe. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid wage laborers. The bourgeoisie has torn away from the family its sentimental veil and has reduced the family. 
been the first to show what man's activity can bring about. It has accomplished wonders far surpassing Egyptian pyramids, Roman aqueducts and Gothic cathedrals. It has conducted expeditions that put in the shade all former exoduses of nations and crusades. The bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relations of society. Conservation of the old modes of production in an unaltered form was, on the contrary, the first condition of existence for all earlier industrial classes. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of, disturbance of all social conditions, Everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguished the bourgeoisie epoch from all earlier ones. All fixed, fast, frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. The need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the whole surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, everywhere settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. The bourgeoisie has, through its exploitation of the world market, given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country. To the great chagrin of reactionists, it has drawn from under the feet of industry the national ground on which it stood. All old established national industry have been destroyed or are daily, daily being destroyed. They are dislodged by new industries whose introductions become a life and that question for all civilized nations by industry that no longer work up indigenous raw material but raw material drawn from the remotest zones industry whose products are consumed not only at home but in every quarter of the globe in place of the old ones satisfied by the production of the country we found new ones requiring for their satisfactions the products of distant lands and climes. In place of the old local and national seclusion and self-sufficiency, we have intercourse in every direction, universal interdependence of nations. The intellectual creation of individuals' nation become common property. National one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness become impossible, and from the numerous national and local literatures, there arise a world literature. The bourgeoisie, by the rapid improvement of all instruments of production, by the immensely facilitated means of communication, throws all, even the most barbarian nations, into civilizations. The cheap prices of its commodities are the heavy artillery with which it batters down all Chinese walls, with which it forces the barbarians' intensely obstinate hatred of foreigners to capitulate. It compels all nations, on pain of extinction, to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst, i.e., to become bourgeois themselves. In one word, it creates a world after its own image. The bourgeoisie has subjected the country to the rule of the town. It has created enormous cities, has greatly increased the urban population as compared with the rural, and has thus rescued a considerable part of the population from the idiocy of rural life. Just as it has made the country dependent on the towns, so it has made barbarians and semi-barbarian countries dependent on the civilized ones nation of peasants on nation of bourgeois, the east and the west. The, bourgeois, the bourgeoisie keeps more and more doing away with the scattered state of the population, of the means of production and of property. It has agglomerated population, centralized means of production, and has concentrated property in a few hands. The necessary 
consequence of this way political centralization. Independent or but loosely connected provinces with separate interests, laws, governments, and systems of taxation became lumped together into one nation with one government, one code of laws, one national class interest, one frontier, and one costume tariff. The bourgeoisie, during its rule of scars 100 years, has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than have all preceding generations together. Subjection of nature's forces to man, machinery, application of chemistry to industry and agriculture, steam navigation, railways, electric telegraphs, clearing of whole continents for cultivation, canalization of rivers, all population conjured out of the ground, was earlier a century had even a presentment that such productive forces slumbered in the lap of social labor. We see then the means of production and of exchange on whose foundation the bourgeoisie built itself up were generated in feudal society. At a certain stage in the, in the development of these means of production and of exchange, the condition under which feudal society produced and exchange the feudal organization of agriculture and manufacturing industry. In one word, the feudal relationship of property became no longer compatible with the already developed productive forces. They became so many fetters. They had to be burst asunder. They were burst asunder. Into their place stepped free competition, accompanied by a social and political constitution adapted to it and by the economical and political sway of the bourgeois class. A similar movement is going on before our own eyes. Modern bourgeois society with its relation of production, of exchange and of property, a society that has conjured up such gigantic means of production and of exchange is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the nethered world, whom he has called up by his spells. For many a decade past, the history of industry and commerce is but the history of the revolt of modern productive forces against modern conditions of, conditions of production, against the property relations, against the property relations that are in the condition are the condition for the existence of the bourgeois and of its rule. It is enough to mention that commercial crisis that, by their periodical return, put on its trial. Each time more threateningly, the existence of the entire bourgeois society. In this cries, a great part not only for the existing products, but also of the previously created productive forces, are periodically destroyed. In this crisis, there breaks out an epidemic that, in all earlier epochs, would have seemed an absurdity the epidemic of overproduction. Society suddenly finds itself put back into a state of momentary barbarism. It appears as if a famine, a universal war of devastation, had cut off the supply of every means of subsistence. Industry and commerce seem to be destroyed. And why? Because there is too much civilization, too much means of subsistence, too much industry, too much commerce. The productive forces at the disposal of society no longer tend to further the development of the condition of the bourgeois property. On the contrary, they have become too powerful for this condition by which they are fettered, and so soon as they overcome these fetters, they bring disorder into the whole of bourgeois society, endanger the existence of bourgeois property. The condition of bourgeois society are too narrow to compromise the wealth created by them. How does the bourgeois get over this crisis? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of a mass of productive forces. On the other, by the conquest of new markets and by the more thorough exploitation of the old ones. That is to say, by paving the way for more extensive and more destructive crises, and by diminishing the means whereby crises are prevented. The weapons with which the bourgeoisie fell the feudalism to the ground are now turned against the bourgeois itself. But not only has the bourgeoisie forged the weapons that bring that to itself, 
it has also called into existence the men who are to wield those weapons, the modern working class, the proletarians. In proportion as the bourgeoisie, i.e. capital, is developed, in the same proportion is the pro pro proletariat, the modern working class, developed, a class of laborers who live only so long as they find work, and who find work only so long as they live increases capital. These laborers, who must sell themselves piecemeal, are a commodity like every other article of commerce, and are consequently exposed to all the vicissitudes of competition, to all the fluctuations of the market. So, this is the first part of chapter one, uh, after which uh, there will be Another chapter sort of picks up on the proletarian and communists. So I will um, sort of continue from there uh, on the next video. If you um, guys uh, like this, I apologize for my English and also I have a cold, so my sort of nose was blocked at times. suggestions as to um, how to improve this format, please let me know. And I'm looking forward to continuing reading um, this chapter for you.